What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So yesterday, sales news broke around the Xbox series that surprised a lot of people online because it shows Microsoft doing something that they haven't been able to accomplish since the launch of the Xbox One. And we're gonna go over that here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about a big feature from Sony and PlayStation that was just randomly announced yesterday online that's certainly gonna have PlayStation gamers wanting to go back to some of these retro titles in that PlayStation Plus premium tier. And we're also going to be talking about a game that's leaked out a bit early through ratings boards for the Switch. This one, though, is pretty much expected. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button. Helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below and ring that notification bell so you can keep up to date with all the uploads here on the channel. And we're going to start today with The Witcher 3. Specifically, though, The Witcher 3, that next generation version. If you remember, it was put on hold after it was brought in-house from CD Projekt, as prior, it appeared that Saber Interactive Russia was working on it, so they wanted to go ahead and bring that in and do the work themselves there. Well, they had sorta said, hey, we're gonna take a look to see how far along it was, and we'll let you guys know when we can expect it. Well, they did tweet this out here. This is from the Witcher uh, game Twitter account, saying, let's make the seventh anniversary even better, shall we? We're delighted to share that the next-gen version of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is planned to release in Q4 2020. 22. See you on the path, Witcher. So this is great news because when they had mentioned, hey, we don't really know when this is going to be coming out now because we have to take a look at what was being done by the porting studio that was developing this patch. I kind of thought it was going to be coming out next year in 2023. And I mean, CD Projekt Red's been facing a lot of issues with their roadmap. So it, this was kind of piling on top of what's already going on with Cyberpunk. So Good to hear that I guess they took a look and said we can get this thing out hopefully before the end of this year and that's where we're going to look for this next gen patch to come out. So exciting stuff there for Witcher fans. Also a couple of years ago we had a game called the Callisto Protocol revealed at the Game Awards and immediately we, we got like Dead Space vibes. It was a horror game in space, right? And then you look at the studio and the creator behind it and it all kind of lines up well. Now, it looks like we're gonna find out a lot of information around this game as it is Game Informer's big cover story. In fact, take a look at the cover for it. It looks great and I mean, yeah, immediately you get the Dead Space vibe. This is, is from Glenn Schofield who formed Striking Distance Studios along with a couple of other studio industry veterans. Uh, and if you remember, Glenn Schofield was working at Sledgehammer Games Hard before that, he was one of the creators of the Dead Space franchise. So again, it all kind of lines up here. It does appear that Game Informer's new issue will be out next week. And they're gonna have a deep dive into the gameplay of the process for how they've gone along to create these different horror games like the Callisto Protocol and of course the buildup for tension, the payoff, how the gameplay all kind of ties together here. So exciting stuff for people who wanted to find out more about this game. It's still slated to come out by the end of this year and that's actually gonna put it almost right up against that Dead Space remake since that is coming out at the end of January. But exciting, exciting stuff to see more about this game because yeah, when you get the creator of Dead Space involved with a game that they can kind of start from scratch and it's horror in space, it's, it's gonna be pretty cool. Oh, and we had just talked about that PlayStation 5 bundle that was spotted online with Horizon Forbidden West. Well, it's once again popped up, this time though, on PlayStation's official website. As before, it looked like it was just in Europe, and now it appears it's gonna be something that's worldwide. We can see this from Wario64. It says, not available yet, but PlayStation Direct has listed PS5 Horizon Forbidden West bundles. That's the disc and digital version. And we have screen grabs of it here for the page, then the, the box art itself for both systems. However, uh, like an hour or two later, the page went down. They were just taking registrations for an opportunity to purchase the PS5 because that's basically how it's been since the system came out now. And I saw that bundle. It makes a lot of sense as like a holiday thing. I don't really know why Sony would do it midway through the year with Horizon for Midwest just coming out a couple of months ago. I mean, it's a good bundle, but it seems like something they would wait to release for the fall. But if it's getting ready to go up now and it's on PlayStation's own website, I guess just keep an eye out so you can get a chance to register for it. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with this Xbox sales news that surprised a lot of people online and caused a lot of conversation. Let's start though with the top 10 from Famitsu, which you can see it here, they're all Switch games, and that's kind of what we expect now. The Switch is absolutely dominant in Japan, but starting at the top, Nintendo Switch Sports, 
47,525. Of course, launching right at the end of April has now accrued over 350,000 copies sold. So pretty good start for Switch Sports there. Then we have Kirby and the Forgotten Land, 14,903. That eclipsing now 700,000 copies. We have Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, because why not? E-Baseball, Powerful Pro Baseball 2022, Ring Fit Adventure, Minecraft, the Centennial Case, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, Mario Party Superstars, and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And while the software was basically expected at this point, the hardware is where there was a lot of conversation. As we see at the top, the Switch OLED model, 35,868. We have the Switch Red Box, 20,443. And the Switch Lite, 9,000 systems. I mean, the top three, yes, are all just variations of the Switch. And it looks like now the Switch is coming up yeah, on, on 25 million units sold. That's pretty impressive there. The Xbox Series S, though, 6,120 systems. Now over 100,000 systems total for the Series S. The PlayStation 5, 2,240. The PS5 Digital Edition, 453. 2DS LL. 235 and then the Xbox Series X at 105 with the PS4 at 22. So if you take the Switch out of the equation here because it's, it's just the runaway success in Japan at this point and you compare the other systems that being the Series S and X versus the PS5 disc and digital yeah the Xbox Series outsold the PlayStation in Japan. I mean, the Series S did it by itself technically, but as pointed out by many people including Game Data Library, not since the launch of the Xbox One has Xbox outsold PlayStation in Japan. It's happened less than 10 times overall. So that would include like the 360 when Xbox was somewhat popular in Japan at that time. I think they sold like one and a half million units. So hey, for an Xbox, that's really good. And trust me, I know if there were more PS5s in stock, the PS5 would have no problem outselling the Xbox at this time, looking at those numbers in Japan. We've seen the PS5 do 20, 30, 40,000 units sold in a given week. But the thing with the, the stock argument currently, we see it all over the place, whoever has the most systems in stock is gonna sell the best. I don't necessarily subscribe to that idea with Xbox in Japan because we watched the Xbox One struggle every single week just to sell a system. There was a point in time where they were trying to sell it as a Blu-ray player, not even a game system. They packaged stuff with it, just trying to get it to move off of the shelf. They're probably getting bored of having to dust the thing every week. But now we see the Xbox Series systems almost double the Xbox One lifetime count and we're not even two years into the system's life. So while it's nowhere near what we're seeing from the Switch or even the PS5, like I said, when the PS5 gets going, it's gonna move millions and millions of units in Japan. We do still have to step back and ask the question, why is uh, the market in Japan more receptive to the Xbox series versus the Xbox One? And it could be marketing, it could be the, the subscription model with Game Pass, also tying things in with your phone and your PC. Uh, it could also be the Series S just being a pretty good value overall at $300. Uh, the Series X, however, though, is coming up on 100,000 units sold as well. It's not too far behind the Series S and it's $200 more. So revenue wise, the Series X, I guess, is more popular. But the idea here is to move as many units as they can in Japan. And the Series S is, is the one leading the way right now for Xbox. Could also be the smaller form factor. I saw that pointed out quite a bit. PS5, it's a pretty big system. So when you're working around fitting a, one of these systems into a, a living room setup, I mean, the Series S is gonna work for most people. But either way, a big accomplishment for Microsoft here. They're certainly showing a, at least a slight turnaround in Japan. And I, like I said, I, I feel like unless the PS5 just is unable to get any stock in stores in Japan, this is probably something that's not gonna happen too often. But either way, I'm curious how far Microsoft can improve the overall Xbox image in Japan because it appears that they're at least off to a good start here with the Xbox series systems. Next up, let's talk about that PlayStation Plus premium tier. It's gonna start rolling out to different parts of the world next week. And we had that entire breakdown with PlayStation blog showing off the selection of games. I'm curious if there, there's gonna be like a big late edition as we roll into June where they're going to do a big launch basically worldwide at that point. But we did have 
an unusual announcement yesterday because I figured this would have been something that would have just been thrown into that blog post. Take a look at this. This was posted up by Ben Studio saying incoming from Ben Studio. Agency Intel reports that Siphon Filter will include trophies when it arrives on the all new PlayStation Plus. They show a trophy popping here, an explosive start, trophy earned. And then just below that replying to this tweet, and yes, you can earn the platinum too. So you'll be able to go back to things like Siphon Filter and say, yeah, I went ahead and platinumed that, that on my PlayStation 5. Quickly jumping over once again to that PlayStation blog entry, I just wanted to run down the different classic titles that will be there at launch, including Ape Escape, Hot Shots Golf, Intelligent Cube, Jumping Flash, Siphon Filter, Super Stardust Portable, Mr. Driller, Tekken 2, Worms, World Party, and Worms Armageddon. I believe all of these will have trophy support. I, I kind of think that's what they were basically announcing there. I know that's technically Ben Studios, PlayStation Studios, but I think at this point, you just have to have trophy support to be in this program. Will that cause a slower rollout? It's possible, but the PS2 games that are like PS4 remasters, like Rogue Galaxy or Jack and Daxter, those also have trophy support. So I love the idea of just adding this in for those original PlayStation games. I know not everyone's a big trophy hunter or anything, but it is kind of cool to get one of those older games that maybe you know like the back of your hand, and you're like, oh, I can beat this game in a couple of hours. Then you look at the trophy list and you're like, you know what, I didn't think to do that. Maybe I will go back and I'll just, I'll platinum Mega Man Legends because like the trophies don't seem that bad and it'll let me run back through it again. It's just a way for Sony to add more value to the service, even if it's more of a superficial thing with trophies, it does work to tie their entire ecosystem together. And that's what they're trying to do with this subscription service. And hey, it's exciting stuff now to think of some of these original PlayStation or yes, even PS2 games getting added that will have trophy support and maybe have us look at these games in a different light as we work to seek out that illustrious platinum trophy. But let me know what game you'd like to see added here with trophies and what game you think you'd be able to platinum with no issue. Next up, let's talk about a Switch game that appears to have leaked out a bit early, probably ahead of that Nintendo Direct that's going to be happening in June. And this from the ratings board in Taiwan, as usual, but we can see this posted up by Switch Brazil. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Anniversary Edition is rated for Switch in Taiwan. There's the rating there. We can see Bethesda Softworks. It was rated on the 15th, actually, of May, pretty recently. So Elder Scrolls Skyrim Anniversary Edition. This is pretty much expected. I mean, is anyone like, wow, they're going to release Skyrim again? Yeah, they're going to release Skyrim again. I mean, we've already had this released on other platforms. We have Skyrim on the Switch. It makes sense. They would bring some of this stuff over. If you just want a reminder, um, we can take a look at PC Gamer here. It has uh, the bullet points for the different uh, aspects to the anniversary edition. Skyrim Special Edition, Skyrim's original DLCs, Dawn Guard, Heartfire, Dragonborn, Next Gen Improvements. So I'm curious if they will do some improvements to this with the Switch version because technically Skyrim on the Switch came out a, a while ago and maybe they've been able to uh, spruce it up a bit here for this release. All 48 previously released creation club items and then 26 new creation club items. So as I said, pretty much expected Skyrim getting released again, this being the anniversary edition. I think this will probably be maybe something in a sizzle reel for that direct. I, maybe they just do a quick cut to it at some point for like 10 or 15 seconds, then move to another one. I am curious if this is going to just be a standalone SKU or if they will offer an upgrade path because I believe they did that for uh, the other platforms where there was like a 15 or $20 charge, then you just moved up into the anniversary edition. But there you go. If you're a big Skyrim fan and you like playing it on the Switch, I guess look out for this one because something tells me it's gonna be announced pretty soon. And in our last bit of news, let's talk a bit about Embracer Group because they had their own financial reports go out and talked a bit to investors, specifically about some of their more recent acquisitions, as well as some projects they have coming up. One being massive, which we'll touch on that and how it looks like the studio that's working on is gonna be getting a little bit of help. First though, let's head over here. This is page four of their investors briefing PDF that they sent out at the bottom here. After the end of the quarter, we further strengthened our development capabilities and IP portfolio by entering into an agreement to acquire Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Montreal, and Square Enix Montreal, including Tomb Raider, Deus Ex Thief, and Legacy of Cain and other IPs. The announcement got an overwhelming and positive response. We see a great potential not only in sequels, but also in remakes, remasters, spin-offs, as well as transmedia projects across the group. 
We expect the transaction to close in the July to September period. Get ready because they are going to unleash remasters and remakes across the board, whether it's maybe even the older Tomb Raider games from like back in the, you could get Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness dropped onto your Switch. Uh, some of the older Deus Ex games, Thief, Legacy of Cain. Embracer Group's gonna go crazy with this and I'm all for it. I like the idea of them going back, getting those older titles. Remakes, maybe not as much because sometimes they'll do a remaster and it's, like an upscale and like they make sure at least runs and then they get the controls just right and sometimes they release and with bugs that they have to patch down the road I, we've seen it before with some of their other titles but i just like the idea that they are going to be looking back into that catalog of intellectual properties that square enix has pretty much just forgotten about however they did mention that this deal won't be closing until sometime between july and september so i'm not really expecting to see much come of this deal when it comes to big announcements until like second half of 2023. But it's pretty cool to think of some of these older IPs coming up as remasters or remakes on the current platforms. Now, one remake we know about that I would say is extremely important is Knights of the Old Republic. And it does look like Aspire is me getting a bit of help here. We can see this posted up by VGC. Saber Interactive is working on the Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic remake with Aspire. This from Matthew Carr, who's a board member with Embrace Group, saying Aspire has gone full in to make this the best game that they can make. When we acquired Aspire, we knew from the start that they would require our assistance. Saber has tremendous expertise in creating these types of products. We've done it on Halo, on multiple Halo products. So we've been spending a lot of time working with them to bring this title over. We're fully confident that the game is going to be fantastic, but it's a massive product and massive products require a lot of effort and a lot of time to make good, especially when you're talking about game that's very old. We've basically had to remake that game from scratch. Now, I do like the way that they're talking about this Knights of the Old Republic remake because when Aspire was announced to be developing it, I was thinking, okay, they do a lot of these remasters of Star Wars games, like it's Jedi Outcast or uh, Pod Racer, and for the most part, they smooth out the visuals, they make it look better on flat screens and all of this, but it's not a full from the ground up remake, which appears to be what they're gonna be doing here. So bringing in Saber is a good idea just to help them out and provide uh, the developers to get it done as Saber is pretty good from the technical side of things. They're the ones who got Witcher 3 working on the Switch, which is still just a magical thing to like witness in person, that game running on a portable system uh, like that. So I'm a bit more confident now when it comes to Knights of the Old Republic remake being worked on by not only Aspire, but Saber Interactive. I still don't think we're gonna hear about this anytime soon. It was certainly an announcement made way in advance. So maybe 2024 for this one, we'll see. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday, where I asked if all three platform holders hold an event in June, which one are you most interested in seeing? We have 56% for Nintendo, 27% for Sony, and then, 17% for Microsoft. Yeah, I think Microsoft just lost a lot of wind out of their sales when we saw Starfield and Redfall get pushed into next year. Nintendo, of course, is, is just, it's, it's generally a surprise with Nintendo, and there are talks about that Metroid Prime remaster or something with the Legend of Zelda collection. Sony, on the other hand, I feel like most people are just hoping to see a release date for God of War Ragnarok and then maybe some interesting reveals for next year. But Nintendo certainly has right now the most coming up in the near future for 2022 and they still have some release dates to drop. Things like Bayonetta 3, we're still crossing our fingers that we see it sometime this year. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Mortem saying, definitely still use my 360 online. It's one of the last consoles with true AV out for CRTs that support services like Netflix and YouTube easily. I use it in my game room with all of my retro consoles. I didn't even think about that, that you can still, yeah, it would work for, for a CRT. It actually reminds me of back in the day when it first came out. Like, you got, you got this component uh, AV uh, cable, right? You could choose between the two, you had a little switch on it and plug into that massive, like, port on the back of your 360. But at the time, flat screens were nowhere near as common as they are now. And you would deal with a CRT TV and the 360, and certain games were not set up for it. I think like Dead Rising, the text was so small you couldn't read it. In other games, I think Call of Duty 2 had a similar issue. So it was it was a strange time, but I didn't even think about that. You know, I haven't actually hooked up a 360 to an AV connection in 
quite a quite a while maybe that's something to check out at some point in the video and ladies and gentlemen that's going to do it here for Newswave. if you enjoyed this video guys hit that like button if not hit the dislike leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today was the xbox series outselling the playstation in japan last week do you think the Xbox is making a bit of a turnaround here in Japan? And then also, what about trophy support for some of those original PlayStation games? What games do you want to see come to the service knowing you'll be able to go through and platinum them? Thanks guys for watching. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back here at Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern time for Newswave.